The views and opinions of the guests do not necessarily reflect those of Millennials' Choice. Viewer discretion is advised. I'm out in Florida and Tampa right now. I'm already known all through this area. Like, I don't play. Like, you say something, I'll punch you in your face for seconds, and that's it. We'll go from there. We'll just fight. I don't care. I'm a cool guy. I'm always smiling. I'm laughing. But when you try to embarrass me or my friends or you take it to that route, then you're going to see the other side of me. I didn't need the Mafia to be a tough guy or be dangerous. I was already that before I was in the Mafia. That's why the Mafia picked me, not because I was a good dancer. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, you know, this is the reason why I was in the Mafia, because I was a violent, dangerous dude. You make a mistake, you get walked into a room by your best friend, you don't walk out again. When you have revenge in your heart, you might as well dig two graves, one for you, one for them. The minute I went into the mafia, I always felt that sooner or later I'm going to get killed or go to prison for the rest of my life. What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Millennials Choice Show. Thanks for watching. The boys are in the studio today. What's going on, everyone? We got a special guest in the house, former associate of the Bonanno crime family, Gene Borello. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me, man. Thanks for doing this. Uh, I know you probably get a ton of requests, but you don't do you don't do much interviews. I think you kind of boycotted YouTube after they censored you or, or something happened. Talk to us about that. Yeah, I was, um, the government kind of came at me for, um, when we started the Johnny and Gene show, um, we were the first to do it, so the government was was targeting us. So basically, I was on federal probation, and they still own me, so they basically, you know, found ways to get me off the air. That's what happened. Yeah, it's crazy with all this censorship, what's going on, and we're in Canada, so they're censoring everybody. <laughs> it's, it's insane what's yeah. going on. Well, with me, the problem was is that they didn't like the things I was saying and they felt like they were still going to need me for cases and they were mad and they just, they just targeted me, man. They took me out, put me back in jail and everything. Man, it's crazy what's going on right now with censorship. Lots of censorship, character assassinations. So we want to talk about all of that stuff. Uh, I'm super pumped about today. Um, I was going through your TikTok, watching a bunch of videos there, man. You tell some crazy stories, man. Insane. Right. Yeah, I got some wild ones. I keep them. I keep them in the pocket. You know, uh, my book is going to become a TV show probably. So you know, I'm going to have a good screenplay going. It's going to be about my neighborhood, and I got so much stuff. Like my book is only ten percent of my life. You know what I mean? So it's going to be wild. Amazing. And for those guys watching and listening, if you guys want to connect with us for exclusive content, join the Discord. The link is in the description below. And from me watching some of your uh, previous interviews with John and uh, Felix. I, we never really hear about like your past and your upbringing and your story and your family life. Why don't you tell us about you as a child growing up, the neighborhood you grew up in, your upbringing, your family? What was your dad like? Talk to us about that. Um, my dad was, uh, was like me. You know, when he came up in Canarsie, he was a stick-up guy, a arm robber, tough guy, did a lot of jail time. Um, when he had gotten out, he met my mom, and um, he just finished doing like eight, nine years. He came home met my mother and my they had me in 84 and then he worked a construction job he worked a lot of days a week you know so he wasn't around much but he provided he did right for us um i lived in canarsie till i was about eight nine years old and then i moved over to ozone park where my mom and dad separated but my childhood was pretty good i always had everything i wanted pretty much but i always wanted more you know what i mean i always it was never enough that was my problem i always wanted more and more and um as i got older you know i was chasing the money you know what i mean but um that, that was ultimately my downfall, you know what I mean? Just kept chasing, chasing, because I always wanted more. But as a kid, like I said, I pretty much had everything I wanted. Um, I was just bad in school. I was just a bad kid. And it wasn't nobody's fault but mine. You know, I just had that, that ADD, ADHD in me. And, you know, I was a wild kid. And, you know, running the streets and, since I'm, you know, a young kid. When did you get introduced to the mafia? What age? I was, in, I mean, the mafia was always in, in, in my face, but, you know... I didn't start working for them until I was about 18 years old. I mean, you know, I already knew what it was when I was talking about 14, 15, but I didn't start working really and doing things for them until I was about 18 years old. Was there like a story or like a time where, you know, you got introduced to, you know, people that were in the mafia and you said, that's what I want. I want to be like these guys, anything like that. 
Well, I mean, when you hang out in Howard Beach, I mean, obviously, that's all you see. So, you know, everybody with the nice cars, the clothes, the money. So, you know, that's pretty much what we wanted. It was all about the money and, you know, being the guy. So that's all around you in those areas. So that's that's really what it was. And it was still a lot going on. I was coming up in the late 90s, early 2000s, where it was still wild and it was still money, a lot of money being made. So it was very intriguing. And why why did you choose the Bonanno family or did they choose you? How did how does that whole dynamic work? I told this story the other day and I was actually explaining it. Um, I'm, I was born in the Gambino family pretty much. What happened was I had a, a, a serious altercation with somebody and he was kind of a Gambino guy. And I wanted to retaliate. I wanted to kill him. And uh, the Gambinos wouldn't take my back. And I went to the other guys because I was best friends with Bobby Gialonzo, and that was Ronnie Gialonzo and Vinny Asaro's nephew. And I said, listen, take my back. They said, we got your back. Go do what you got to do. So they gave me the green light. I said, you know what? These guys want to be softies. These Gambino crew, they want me running around with guns and shooting people and doing that crazy stuff. They were more about the money. Ronnie G and them were more about both, money and violence. So I was went with them, and they gave me the green light. They said, do what you got to do to them. And that's why I pretty much went with them. That's really what it was. And who was the boss at that time of the Bonanno family? When I first came on, it was Joe Messino. He didn't cooperate yet. Got it. And then it went from Joe to Vincent. Vinny Gorgeous. Yeah. And then it went from Vinny Gorgeous to Mikey the Nose. Yeah. So what happened though after with the Gambino family when they when I don't know if you like ended up doing the hit or retaliated? Were they upset at you or? Like, because the Banana family had your back at this point, right? No, no, they weren't upset with me. It's just that I didn't like the fact they didn't take my back. One wise guy was going to take my back, Mikey Rockefeller. He says, don't worry, I got you. But his crew captain wasn't Al Trucchio, Ronnie Warm's son. And I kept telling him, you know, take my back. I'm going to get this guy. He hired Albanians to kill us. They shot my friend in the neck, shot my other friend. I says, I'm, I'm going to kill this kid. You know what I'm saying? We got to get this guy. And he's like, no, no, don't that gun shit. He didn't want the violence. He wanted mm. to squash it a different way. No, we're not squashing it that way. We're getting him. I don't want to hear nothing else but kill him. And um, uh, they didn't want to deal with that, so I went to the Banano guys because I was floating. I was best friends with Bobby. A lot of my friends were over there, and my, all my friends were in Gambino. It was like a mix. You know, Banano Gambino is shared in Howard Beach. It's shared territory. It's flooded with both families. So I went with the Banano family. They, they were upset about it, but it is what it is. I told him he should have took my back and said I was with you and let me go get this guy for what he did. You know what I'm saying? He shot innocent people. He's got to get dealt with. You know what I mean? And that was really what, 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 what made me go over there. Was this at the time when John Gotti was the boss of the Gambino? No, John was dead already. Oh, I Peter see. Gotti was the boss. Did you ever have any run-ins with John or did you meet him? John Senior? Yes. No, no. no. I mean, of course, my family knew him and everyone, but I never, I never met him physically, no. Now you're you're friends with John A. Light. He you know he was the one who put us in touch and and we we interviewed with him in person at his home recently. Um, why? Right. You, so so John is obviously like I I don't want to ask you a dumb question. He's obviously who he says he is. But why do you think of he course. takes? Yeah, why do you think he takes a lot of heat like online? What what's up with that? Um, it's the Gotti family. You know they don't want to admit to you know the things that he talks about and. They get mad that he looks because he was so notorious. They got, they want to knock him down to make him look like he was nothing. That's what they do. You know, at the end of the day, John Jr. cooperated too. So, you know, they could sit there and say, no, no, no. I was involved in that life. John Jr. is considered a rat. Uh, his family is the only one that doesn't want to hear it. So they try to knock Johnny A. Light and everything he says because he was really doing all that stuff. You know, everybody knows that. Johnny A. Light was, was very feared in our area. So, you know, anyone that you talk to that's from Oldsman Park, Cow Beach, that grew up knows what he was doing. So it's not, there's nothing even to talk about. Like, you know, who's who, you know what I'm saying? There's nothing to, to lie about. Yeah. So you, you obviously like, you know, John well, right. And you obviously know the beef that he has between Sammy, the bull Gravano, right? Like, what do you have to say about that beef in terms of one person saying one thing and the other person saying another thing, you know, they're both, in my opinion, who they say they are. Why do you think there's this kind of like discrepancy between them, right? Because they both, I think, are the real deal. What do you think? I always say this. You can't put five Italian gangsters in the room together. They'll all be fighting with each other. It's always a pissing contest with us. Who's tougher? Who's better? 
who's got more shootings, murders. It's just the way we are, bro. I'm sorry. It's just our culture. <laughs> we can't help it. <clears throat> you know, we're very competitive. We want to be the guy. You know, everyone, everyone I know is like that. So, you know, we're used to it. That's all it is. It's a pissing contest. Got it. Uh, with regards to being in the mafia when you were in that life, what was one of the worst things that you did or one of the worst things that you experienced? One of the worst things that I've ever experienced? Yes. I mean, you know, we, uh, me and my partner have beaten a guy nearly to death, uh, put him in a coma for two weeks with, with a tire iron and breast knuckles. We've done horrific things, you know, um, shot people, you know, dug holes, tried to kidnap people, kill them, put them in holes, you know. I've done a lot of fucked up shit. I watched my friends get shot through the neck, shot. Uh, my house was shot up with a machine gun. I've been through so much, you know what I mean? In jail, I seen a guy get killed right in front of me, stabbed in the neck. And the face, you know, I did just so much. I could just keep going. You know, my whole life has just been nothing but chaos. So, I mean, it's just too much. It's not just one thing. It's just so many. Was there a time during that time period of your life where you were very active? Was there a time where you kind of screwed up and thought maybe you were going to get like killed for it? Like maybe you. Oh, you, fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was one of the most memorable times where that happened? Can you share a story with us? Oh, man. Which one? Um, so, one we've never uh, heard before. One we've I mean, never I, heard before. I, I stuck up uh, Junior Ruggiero's card game. I should have been killed for that. Um, I tried to stick up Ali Shades, a captain for the Genovese family. Um, let's see. I ran down on a captain from the Colombo family, sat on his house for Ronnie. I mean, there's so many situations. I mean, I guess we'll start with the card game. I stuck up uh, John Gotti's right-hand man, uh, Quack Quack, his son's uh, card game. We pissed up the guy, robbed him. It was Forget it. It was bad. He got caught. Everything. So what, ha what happened? Like when you got caught, were you like scared? Like these guys are going to whack me or was it just like, ah, you know what? It's a slap on the wrist maybe because I'm an earner or, you know, what were you, what were you no, thinking? I, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure what was going to happen. You know what I mean? I was kind of new in the life. I knew the rules. So I, I was young and, um, me and Bobby had did it and, um, we got caught on the ball camera. They knew it was us. We had to give everything back. Um, we had to meet them in a funeral hall basement. Yeah. It was pretty bad. I didn't know if we were going to get killed or not. Yeah. You know, we did something really bad. And in that situation, what happens? Like somebody from your family sits down with them and tries to calm everybody down sort of thing? Well, you see, they got to sort it out to make sure that my people didn't send us there because that becomes a turf war now. You're, ten mm -hmm. you're sending your people to violate our territory. So it was a big politics involved. They wanted to make sure that Ronnie and Vinny and these guys didn't send them deliberately to disrespect their place. And we didn't know whose place it was, but we kind of did. We were playing it off, and we got caught doing it, and um, we had to get dealt with. You know what I mean? It was, it was out of respect for my Uncle Andy that I didn't get killed. That's what they said. I think you're here for a reason. I think, I think you're here for a reason, and uh, you weren't supposed to go out like that. So you believe in God, or do you believe in spirituality or faith at all? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I should have been killed a bunch of times. You know what I mean? Bullets... So many times bullets passed my head, you know, it's just amazing how I'm still here. And um, so many times I should have been dead and I'm not or uh, doing life in prison. You know, it's just it, I'm just lucky to be sitting here right now and talking to you guys or even being out. You know, it's amazing. You know, do you believe uh, if there is a heaven and a hell, do you believe in heaven or hell? And, and if you do, where do you think your place would be? Um, I mean, uh, oof, I'd definitely probably be hell, but I mean, uh, hopefully I could get, hopefully I can make up for it and go upstairs. I mean, but, um, I did a lot of bad stuff in my life, so I don't know. You know, I mean, if there is heaven and hell, I definitely, I definitely deserve to go downstairs, but we'll see. Do you, on that note, do you regret anything that like all the things that you did in terms of the murders, the violence, do you regret any of it right now? Or is it just kind of like, well, that was the life I chose. You know, I loved it. The people that were in that life knew what they were signing up for and they had what was coming to them. Like, how do you live right now? Yeah, well, well, that's how we justify it. You know what I mean? Because uh, we feel like bad guys hurting bad guys. It, it is what it is. But, you know, that's not how the FBI looks at it or the government or other people in society. But, you know, we kind of look at it as we're hurting each other. It's not like we're going after doctors and lawyers and stockbrokers and civilians, you know, where... You know, we're, we're killing each other, hurting each other. So I look at it as if at the time I really didn't care, you know, to be honest with you. Now I look at it as you get older, you know, damn, you know, what a waste of life. You only live once and it's just like it was so pointless. You know what I mean? 
So we sat down with Anthony Ruggiano Jr. And we had an interview with him and we were chatting it up with him. And, and the question about heaven or hell and all these bad things that he did came up as well. And he, he, believes, he believes in what we believe in, where there is, you know, that free gift of going to heaven. And so, you know, he got, he got a bit emotional on, on the, the interview and it was a great interview. And he was just reminiscing about some of the things that he did or the guys that he was with around it. So um, I guess his message was like, there is that hope. So kind of want to just relay that to you, just that there is that hope that you can't earn it. You can't do anything to earn it. What's done is done. It's the past. But there is that belief uh, in God where you could go to heaven and you could go to heaven if you mean it. Even Apostle Paul, St. Paul, he was a murderer. He was a murderer before he became one of the most influential figures in the New Testament, in the Bible. Right. So I just want to leave that with you. I mean, yeah, you know, my cousin, you know, my, my cousin's definitely upset, Anthony. You know, he killed his own brother-in-law. So, you know, I know he's got a lot of grief with him. So, you know, killed, you know, it's a rough, his situation's rough, you know what I mean? Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I definitely believe in it. Don't get me wrong. I just, I just hope that, you know, I get, I get an opportunity to go to heaven. You know, I don't want to go to hell if there is. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, a lot of times guys come on the show, we talk to them, we talk to Michael, Anthony Arlotta, different different guys about their prison experience. Why don't you tell us about My your prison experience? Because I think, correct me if I'm wrong, you served about 13 years overall across your, your prison experience, right? Yes, I served a total of 13 years in prison. Um, you know, I had a lot of crazy experiences. I've been in, um, I've cut people, stabbed people, beat people up. I mean, I did everything. Fights, I've been in the hole for a long time. You know, I had a bad, I had a bad experience in um, uh, Rikers Island. You know, I mean, just in general, uh, sitting up for 19 months in C95, which was the most violent building at the time. And it was just nothing but chaos. You know, you couldn't even enjoy coming out because you never could come out. Once you come out, they're cutting each other or someone's killing each other. So all the stuff that we see in the movies and the shows about prison where, you know, some guys are in the chow line getting food and someone just comes up to them and like shivs them. Is that real? Like, does that happen? Have you seen something like that happen in prison or? Yeah. Um, I mean, you'll never, you'll never know when it's coming. You know, like when something's about to happen, they do hit you unexpected. I've seen it all. Yeah, mess hall fights. I've seen people get stabbed. I've seen everything you could see in the movies except the rape stuff. I've never seen that. That's like movie stuff. It does happen, I believe, but very rarely. It's like getting struck by lightning. And mm -hmm. for the people that are happening to, they wanted to. They're mostly gay, you know, whatever. So um, uh, I've, seen, I've seen it all, bro. I've seen guys at... I've seen guys light people up, smoke with them, walk with them, and they're plotting them the whole time. They're going to cut them at the end of the walkway or stab them. I've seen it all, bro. It's all real. You know, there's no, it's all element of surprise in there. You know, I've seen them all get jumped, things thrown over their heads, beaten with lock and socks. I mean, literally, guys get beat to death. You know, like I said, there's nothing I haven't seen in prison. So taking all of your experience in the life and bringing it to prison, what would you say was the one thing that you learned in the life that helped you to survive in prison? Was it the way to negotiate or like talk to people? Was it the fighting, the physical self-defense that you learned or what, what was it? To survive in there, I would say, you know, I was a street dude, but when I went into prison, um, it was a lot different. You know what I mean? I seen you, you're by yourself, especially, you know, uh, I'm an Italian guy. I'm a Caucasian as they, you know, we're not considered white in jail, but our skin is white. So we're the only very limited in there. So a lot of them are punks, so I wasn't. Um, but you definitely learn how to be, it makes you more tougher, it makes you more dangerous because the shit that's going on in there, man, you gotta fight for a chair, phone call, you know, your food, you don't wanna get robbed, you don't wanna be known as a punk. It's a lot of shit, it's nonstop stress. You know, you can't see visits get shut down, you don't have family, friends, you know, you gotta lock in, you can't use the phone. It, it, really, it really makes you mentally strong as well, especially when you go to the hole, which I've done months in the hole. Um, it, you you have nothing but just the walls, you know. You have nothing or nobody, so you got to learn that you're not going the way. You got to deal with it, and it makes you very mentally strong. I came out very mentally strong, man. And when it comes to the whole, like we were saying, we you know we've gotten we've spoken to different people like Michael Francis and all these other guys that were in the life, and they have different experiences of you know when they're in the hole, and Sammy as well too. What was your experience like? Can, I know you just mentioned it. Can you get a little deeper? Like, what did you do when you were there? Did you just work out? 
Did you read books? Like, what was what was it well, like there? Well, you understand, it's very, you, you get in this routine. You're going to do the same thing every day. You're going to wake up. You're going to get your breakfast at this time. After you get your breakfast, you're going to lay around for a little while. You're just going to sit there. You wait for lunch. Then you might try to work out in between lunch, and you get dinner. The last time you eat is at 430 you're going to know you're going to be starving from 4.30 to 6 in the morning. Mm. So you got to figure out ways to hold bread, hold something to make it where you could have a little something, you know, to make you survive through the night because there's no commissary. You know, then you get your shower three times a week. It's a schedule. It's the same schedule every single day. So you just got to get used to it. You know what I mean? So that's all you could do. That's what I would do. Bro. I, would, I, would, I would know my schedule and just do the same thing every day, bro. That's it, literally, legitimately. There's nothing else you can do. You could read a book if you want in between, but there's only so many books you could read. You know what I mean? So it gets burnt out. So you're basically just laying in your bed, bro. Truthfully. Yeah. And with regards to when you came out of prison, I think, was it the first time where you came out because you informed? Was that the, was that the situation the first time around? No, I had did, um, I had did 18, I did 20 months, my first bid. I did three to six years, my second bid. And then my third bit, I did six years. And then I did violations of a total of about two years. But the six-year one, the six year one when, I, when I was facing life, that's when I uh, cooperated and I was supposed to go away forever. I ended up doing six years on that. Dad came home in 2019 of December. So there's different opinions on, I'm sure you've seen on YouTube about snitching and, and ratting and things like that. Where do you stand on that? Well, how do you see things? Uh, well, how do I feel about it? Yeah, like, what are your thoughts about it? Some guys say, like, for example, uh, Sammy says, well, John was going to give me up, so that's when I knew that this whole thing meant nothing. No. Nah, different guys say different I don't things. make excuses. My, I have no excuse except the fact that I didn't want to die in prison for these people. That's just the bottom line. They didn't look out for me. I'm not going to make excuses. I cooperated. I could have took my 35 years. That, that was my cop out. And, I, you know, I said they don't want to pay my lawyer. They don't want to look out for me. They go fuck themselves. But at the end of the day, I don't want to die in jail anyway because I never would have copped out 35. I would have went to trial, blew, and got life. So I know I was a lifer, and I didn't I didn't want to do it. So that's just what it is. They could take it how they want it. I know these guys, my co-defendants, weren't facing no time. They were facing five years. The most guy in my case got 14 years. I did six years cooperating. I did more time than got most of my guys on, on my case. <laughs> and I cooperated. You know, I was the one with all the serious charges, me and Ronnie, basically. And Ronnie got 14 years. He had to pay back a ton of money. And these guys are facing no time. So you never know what they would do. Who's ratting over 5, 10 years, 15 years? When he starts going to 30s and 40s, anybody could be a rat. You just don't know who. Nobody wants to take that kind of time. It's life-changing time. So that's it. You know, you never know who's going to do what. That's how I look at it. What about the whole YouTube space where... Um, there's guys coming on, like even bosses of families coming on and just talking and talking and talking. And like, what are your <laughs> thoughts on that? Is that, is that snitching as well? Of course. No, no wise guy recognize Joey Molino ever again. He can't do that. Sit on a thing. New York will never recognize him again. He knows that, but he don't care because he know the life is dead. He knows there's going to be no consequence behind it because nothing's going on. Nobody's shooting nobody no more. Nobody's killing nobody no more. He wouldn't have came on 20 years ago as an active boss. I'll tell you that much. He'd be off the map. Why do you think that? Why do you say, you know, the life is dead? Like, let's unpack that a little bit. Are you saying like those guys are not really active as much because they can't make as much money as they used to? Or is it no, something the money, like... No, the money's still there. The violence is gone. The violence is gone. The capability. The guys have no ball. These all spoiled kids coming up now. All, all, silver, all gold, you know, silver spoons in their mouth. They don't have... They're not hungry. They're not street guys. They're more, my dad's rich was a gangster, so I am one now. They don't have to earn that title, go out there and rob and shoot and do wild shit that we were doing. These kids in our neighborhoods now don't do that no more. It's all just third generation, fourth generation punks. They never even been in a fist fight, living off a name. So there's no more violence. When we were coming up, there was hundreds of guys like me. So everybody was wild. We were just like the gang members. We were fucking nuts. There's no more of that. It's just about money and you know who I am. That's it. So there's no one's scared of that. If you're not going to pay with your life when you break a rule, what are they scared of? Oh, you're going to slap me? I don't care. You know, when you, when, you, when you die, when you're paying with your life, that makes people scared. When you're not paying with your life, nobody gives a fuck. They can tell you go fuck yourself. That's what I wanted to ask you. So obviously, like you cooperated. Were you worried that, you know, you were going to no. get whacked? Nothing like that? Like no. around this time? No? Hell no. I was the bad guy. I went back and lived in my old neighborhood driving a fucking $180,000 Porsche. I didn't give a fuck. 
I told him, come shoot me. Between nine of you, you ain't fucking you ain't got no balls. None of the, the, the crew is weak. I knew they weren't going to do nothing. I was the bad guy. I told my prosecutor, you pretty much want me in jail. If it wasn't for Ronnie and Vinny, I'd die in prison. I was the bad guy. You know what I'm saying? Like, you, there's nobody really out there no more for the mob, at least, that's going to really, like, really about that. The gang members, that's different. They're all like that. But for me, nobody was really like that in the mafia no more. But surely, like, when you're walking around in, right now in your life, everyday life, you, you probably don't keep the same schedule. You don't go down the same path, like, routine or repeat it every day. Just, just in case. No, you're, Are you looking with I mean, one... Uh, I, I'm going to be honest with you, bro. I, I, I'm an arrogant fuck. Like, I, I, like, you know, if it comes, it comes. Like, no one's approaching me, disrespecting me. They come at me the wrong way. I'm punching. Like, I'm very confrontational. I'm very hands-on. So it's not like I'm just talking to talk. I walk the walk. Like, dudes know how I am. You're not going to just come with me and say something to me. You got to be that guy. You know what I mean? So, like, guys know that already. Most of the people I run into just say hello to me. I walk off. I'm going to be honest with you. You know, I was, I was known say... as a weapons guy. I'll shoot you in broad daylight. I didn't give a fuck. So they're not going to just approach me like oh you're the, it's got to be a certain guy that will come up to me and say yo fuck it. and there is a few of them but i haven't ran into one yet to be honest with you i feel like you're the guy like you're if you're at the gym and somebody comes like to take your bench or something like they're really like screwing with the wrong guy like at the wrong place at the wrong time and like i feel like you wouldn't oh. mind like handling them right then and there yeah I'm out in Florida and Tampa right now. I'm already known all through this area. Like, I don't play. Like, you say something to me, I'll punch you in your face in two seconds, and that's it. We'll go from there. We'll just fight. I don't care. I, I'm very, like, they know how I am. I don't try to impose my will. I'm friendly. But once you get disrespectful, that's it. I, I switch. Other than that, I'm a cool guy. I'm always smiling. I'm laughing. But when you try to embarrass me or my friends or you take it to that route, then you're going to see the other side of me. It's just that simple. I didn't need the mafia to be a tough guy or be dangerous. I was already that before I was in the mafia. That's why the mafia picked me, not because I was a good dancer. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, you know, this is the reason why I was in the mafia, because I was a violent, dangerous dude. And I'm still that guy, but I just don't, well, I don't, I don't look for trouble, but I don't run from it. So if guys try to, you know, fuck with me, then it's, it's, it's lit. It don't matter, you know? Just because I cooperate don't mean my nuts are clipped. You know what I'm saying? It don't change nothing. I'm just a different sure. person. I don't look for trouble. That's all. So in jail, I feel like they would want to recruit you like you were a first draft pick when you walked in. No? Or was it like yeah. did they, I when mean, they the saw you, did they want to like, they're <laughs> like, hey, that guy looks like he's, you know, he's down. He's down to scrap. Let's let's pick him up. Like, how'd that work? I mean, not really. The gangs are the gangs. You know, they just like the Italian guys. We get along with them. They love the mafia stuff. But other than that, they got so many people. They don't need nobody. They're fucking, they're so deep in there. Don't get me wrong. I was friends with all of them. They all respected me. But like. I would never join their gang, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm my own thing. We look, you know, we would never do that. That's like corny. That's like looking for protection. You know, I just carry myself and if shit comes my way, then we I handle it. Did anyone try to punk you there knowing like you're not a part of one of the big gangs like the whites yeah, or the blacks absolutely. or the Spanish? Yeah, it's in yeah? my book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what'd you do? Like, can you tell us that story? Like what happened? Someone came up, came up to you and said, give me your food and you're just like, screw off or... What well, happened? no, he was trying to extort my friend, and he knew he was my friend, and I had a situation with him. I ended up hitting him with a plastic chair in his head. He was a big guy, and then I ended up uh, pulling out a knife on him. It was a whole, it was a whole mess, but uh, it was this guy. He was coming down from a 25-to-life reversal. Uh, he had got a reversal. He's down on Rikers Island, and he's facing a ton of time. He's been down a long time, real rowdy, real disrespectful, chasing drugs, and he was trying to, like, oppose his will. He's, like, six foot five, big, big black dude, and... Um, he picked the wrong, he picked my friend. He was trying to punk him, take his stuff. And I told him, yo, you do it again. I'm, I'm going to stab you. And then that's it. We got into it. I hit him with a chair. I chased him down the tier with a knife. It was a whole big thing. And, uh, then I went to the hole and came out. That was it. And he, he left, but, mm -hmm. um, we almost went at it. I, I told you, I don't back down from nobody, but this dude was big, bro. You know? And he was trying to say like, oh, your friend's going to pay me or you are, you know, he was just trying to be be a tough guy. And the other guy said, yo, this kid's not a slouch. Like he's, fa I was facing life at the time. He's like, yo, this kid is in a slouch. He's like, oh, I don't give a fuck. And as soon as they opened my door, I went right after him. And then, you know, that was it. It was just a, a riot. And then I got taken out. I got sprayed with mace in my face. Fucking worst feeling ever, bro. That's crazy, man. And, and you're most Yeah, recent... I got hit in the face with, pe with pepper spray. That shit burns. Oh, my God, it burns. How long does it last? Does it last for like a day or like hours or? Bro, when you go in, I got hit. I got hit three different times. Um. Um, I got hit three different occasions. The one got me in my face. That shit goes in your ears. 
It goes down your body. When you shower, it reactivates it. That shit starts burning again. It, it burns your whole body. It drips down your whole body. It shit burns, bro. Your earlobes are burning, everything. Was it your most recent experience where you had a run-in with Sam Bankman Freed? Was that the most recent yeah, experience? Yeah, oh, yeah. I, I ended up beating up some blood kid for him. They were trying to get money out of him. And I ended up uh, fighting with this kid and uh, I had to look out for him. I didn't like it. And I ended up going to the hole for like 80 days. Yeah. So they threw, so they threw him in a very like serious prison? No, he wasn't even in a serious spot. It was just that these, there was some kids. I was in a dropout unit. It's like I was in a high profile unit. Sorry. So there's like certain people in it, but you still have a lot of dangerous guys in there. And the kid was just trying to like manipulate him out of money and scam him. And we ended up getting into it. And I, we got into a fight. I got him. And um, I went to the hole. That was it. And I, I went home from the hole. I didn't care, you know? But what made you want to defend him or kind of like stick up for him? I don't like that. I, I don't like that because the guy's harmless. He's literally legitimately a harmless dude and didn't know anything that was going on. And you got this little punk trying to like manipulate him and tell him it's dangerous. You need protection. Like, get the fuck out of here, bro. Like, do that shit to me. You know, and that's how I felt. And then um, I, he approached me, told me to come over here. Yo, stay away from us. He says, bro, who the fuck are you talking to? And he swung at me. That was it. I hit him with hot coffee, cracked him, ragdolled him, went right to the hole. They took me out. I feel like you like to stick up for the little guys. Like you don't, like you don't want to let yeah. people just run up on other people that you like they can't defend themselves. So you kind of stick up for them. Yeah, I just don't like that. Nobody likes that. You know, even you pick it on a, a dude that can't even defend himself. This dude is like harmless. Like you know, he's in there for stealing bitcoins. You know, he's never been in jail. He's like a, <laughs> he's like a fucking herb. Like you're gonna pick on this kid. Like I wasn't feeling it. It's not happening. Not on my watch. I respect that. Yeah. Sam Bankman yeah. Freed, don't forget about Gene Barello if you ever get out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want to shift focus to, um, you know, recently uh, Get Gotti was dropped on Netflix. Your cousin was on there. He's primary figure on there. But then there was another figure who uh, you had some words to say about her, Andrea Giovino. <laughs> and I mean, I, I think it all started with uh, Michael Francis. He said something about, yeah, talk to us about that. Like, Listen. what are your thoughts? That, that's, that was, I don't know why they put that on the show. I told my cousin why they put this. It looks so stupid. Um, the show is great. Sal, you know, Sal, Sal, my cousin, they did a great job. You know, they were really in the street. They were really in the mafia with these guys. But to put her on there and talk about my crew and all this stuff, it was just so bad. And it, it didn't make sense. I knew who she was dating. She dated Frankie Lino. Frankie Lino was a banana hitman. He was a real guy. He was a cooperator as well. But he was a murderer. He had like seven, eight murders. Him, his brother was Eddie Lino. Eddie Lino was the one who, one of the shooters on Paul Castellano. You know, they are real serious people. But she used that to say that she's in a crew. She wasn't in a crew. She wasn't an associate of the family. John Cena didn't, probably didn't even know who she was. I'm going to be honest with you. Probably never met her in his life. It was just something where she jumped on Netflix to look cool. And like I said, when you're talking, people from other states don't understand this stuff. So if you're talking and you're from Minnesota, Texas, Kentucky, you could tell them anything you want. Not to us. Not guys from the five boroughs that are in their life. We're going to laugh at you. It's like me trying to tell a guy from Texas about his gang. You can't. You know what I mean? It, we know she's full of shit. You know, there's no a woman associate of the Gambino family. You know, so Mike Francis, who was the captain in the Colombo family, knows very well what he's talking about. I was involved my whole life. I was proposed to be a member. I know what I'm talking about. My cousin was a member. You know, these guys, we know what we know. You're not a part of the mafia. You aren't an associate. You had nothing to do with the mafia. You were just Frankie Lino's side piece. That's all you are. And he might have told you some stories. That's it. So, Gene, why do you think this lady, Andrea, would go, you know, on the show and say who she, who she said she was? You know, that she was an associate and that she was making money and she knew John Gotti like that. Uh, like, was it just for clout for her to, you know, blow up her yeah. name? Everybody wants to go. Everybody wants to go viral, bro. And they're bullshitting now to go viral. Like that guy, the other guy, Ramondi, the one that says he killed 600 people. These guys are all full of shit. You know what I'm saying? It's like, oh, it's just people coming on here and just fucking talking nonsense. You know what I'm saying? It's like, we know who the real ones are. Me, Anthony Arrelada, my cousin, Johnny A. Light, Sammy Gavano, Mikey Scars, Dominic Sicali, Hootie, even Jimmy Calandra, Frankie Ferrandino, Anthony Russo. We were really involved. So when we're on there talking. You know, people are going to take our word for it. We were really in this life, you know, all former gangsters, all had federal RICO racketeering cases with the crew under FBI surveillance. We're on, on pitches with bosses. That's when you sit down and say, oh, this guy was really known. He known, not a 
woman who, you know, who nobody's going to take seriously, you know, or even believe any of this shit. You know, it actually made the show look stupid, to be honest with you. But I guess Netflix needed somebody to talk, you know? I don't know. In all fairness to Andrea, she did say that when she responded to Michael, she said that, it wasn't her who said she was an associate. It was just what Netflix, the production, put as her label, but that she was in the streets and was doing loan sharking and things like that. But she, ne <laughs> but she never claimed to be an associate. Yeah, bro. So I think I think she did though. Like in the show, she kept talking like she was saying, "Oh, we did yeah. this. We were making money and stuff." Really? Right? That's that's hey, what I remember that she was. Hey, she was doing loan sharking. Let me find out. Let me let me go borrow some money off her. Everybody would have beat her on money. If she's a loan shark, she would have got beat on every dollar. Nobody would have fucking paid her. Are you kidding me? Loan shark. These people are crazy. <laughs> These stories are fucking nuts. The thing that a confuses me, Gene, like the thing that confuses me is like you have someone like you, someone like Michael Francis, like well-respected people. Like people know like you guys were there, you were about that life, and you guys did what you say you did. And you guys are just showing, like showing the light, showing everybody, listen. This girl, no one knows her. We don't know her. So what she's saying can't be true. But then I think she's saying, well, all the people that knew me are in jail right now. They can't really say, you know, who I am because they're in jail. What, do, what would you say to that? What would you say to her if she's full, watching this? No, she's, full, she's full of shit. Like I said, everybody knows everybody. Did I meet Mike Francis? No, because he was older than me, but I knew who he was. Did I meet Sammy Gavano? No, but I knew who he was. Uh, did I meet um, Johnny in the street? Yes, I did. But, you know, most of the people, you know who's who at the end of the day. The five families is very small. It's a very small thing. Everyone knows who's who. If you say, hey, that's um, Mikey Scars from Brooklyn. You know there's only one Mikey Scars from Brooklyn. You know what I'm saying? It's with the Gambino family. It's very limited people. Nobody nobody heard this lady. She was, like I said, she dated a gangster. She was a, probably a side, a side piece. He fucked her twice a week, whatever, you know, paid her rent. He was, and, and she told him, some, he told her some stories and she went on TV and says, I was associate with John Gotti. You know, it's the sickest thing. You know, people are doing it all over, but they're, they're, people know they're full of shit. You know what I'm saying? It, you know, they know what's real and what's not. And she went on there. I don't know why they put her on there, but I mean, I, I, I can't figure it out. I, I still can't wrap my head around it. Like, it just looks so stupid. I think it was you. a good show, like how they did it. But obviously, like when we hear this, like. Do you think that it kind of discredits like the show? And do you think it makes people yeah. think that their every like other stuff could have been, um, you know, um, made it's up? It's almost like they're changing history. It's like it's annoying me. It's, um, it's almost like they're changing history. These people are trying to change history, like things that didn't happen. Like you didn't loan shock. You weren't a bookmaker for John Gotti. Think about like Let's break this down. John Gotti was the strongest guy in the country at one time. You mean to tell me he's going to call this girl and go, hey, I want you to bookmake and loan shark for me? It doesn't make sense. He had every single guy, like, he had a murdering team that were just murderers. He had these millions of dollars coming in. He's going to mean to tell me he's going to want this lady to do loan shocking and bookmaking and do things for him? Like, come on. It sounds so stupid. You know what I mean? It's just stupid. It is. I guess to play a little bit of uh, dev devil's advocate, because Andrea's not here. She can't defend herself. But just devil's advocate is uh, two things. Number one, what does your cousin Anthony Ruggiano Jr. have to say about this? Because he's been on her podcast. He has a good relationship with her. And number two, she got arrested in 1992. They did drop the charges, but she did get arrested. I mean, she must have been on somebody's radar at some point for something. What would you say to those I two mean, points? Yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't mean you're an associate of the Gambino family because you got locked up for pushing cocaine. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> or something like that. It's not like you want a Rico racketeering case. You know, like not like you are part of a crew. You know what I mean? Most of the guys that I know, when you are part of a crew, you're on a Rico racketeering case. Like most of the people, I, everyone I just named. Rico racketeering, most of them facing life in prison with murders, shootings, robberies, assaults, loan shocking, gambling, arson, you name it. That's what I was charged with. That's what most of us are charged with. That's a Rico racketeering case. Not I push drugs and I might know somebody and now I'm an associate of a crime family. Don't work like that. Do you think maybe she was like very low level, like very entry? Nah, like, she no. had nothing to do with organized crime, bro. Straight up. Nothing to do with organized crime. Did you nothing. talk to Anthony about it at all? Huh? Did it ever come up with you and your cousin with Anthony? I'm going to be on his show soon and I'll, I'll surely go off on her on that too. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um... Shifting gears a little bit, 
Uh, you did a recent episode with John and Felix, and right. we like to look at some of the YouTube comments, even on our channel. I'm sure we're going to get a lot on this video as well, because you do big numbers. Um, most, right. of, most of your comments are great. Like People love you and love hearing from you. So it was hard to find some negative comments. We like to read out. We, we read some negative ones with John as well when we were in, in Jersey, and we had a good time with him. And it's always a good part of part of our interview. So if you don't mind, we got like a few negative YouTube comments. If you want to respond to them, we're not going to read who they're from, but we'll just read the comments again. These aren't us. So don't shoot the messengers, but they're (laughs) they're from some, some people on YouTube. So I'm going to read a couple of them. So the first one is so crazy. Gene just goes to jail constantly and it's never his fault. Someone's always picking on him, always exaggerating. And he's just the guy who beats up bullies for weak people and helps everyone. Crazy how that works. Oh, and the federal judge just feels like he's a good guy and doesn't believe his federal officer. So he's being very sarcastic in what he's saying. Well, I mean, it's true. The judge did like me. You know, I I did change. So if I was the old person, Judge Block would have put me in jail. I had everybody against me. So obviously the judge seen that I wasn't old Gene Barello. Because otherwise, I wouldn't have got these sweet deals that he gave me on these violations. You know, I was supposed to do five years on these violations, and I ended up doing 20 months for all of them. You know what I mean? And he just looked out for me. Um, He knew that I was with a crazy girl, and, you know, a lot of crazy shit was going on. And, you know, he understands that. You know, they tried lying. FBI was exaggerating. He said I went into a bar, pulled a gun on somebody. Like, it was all bullshit stories. They were trying to make me look like a gangster again so he could hurt me. The government was mad at me over this Johnny and Gene show shit, so they were just trying to put me back in prison. Judge Block wasn't having it. That's it, you know? Too bad. All right, and and the second one is, don't wish jail, prison, or any hardship upon anyone, but it really seems like he's a loose cannon. Loose cannons are unpredictable and dangerous. I really hope he has his temper and attitude under control he seems really chill in this video. Hopefully for his sake, this is the new always on, always chill gene. Hopefully he can stay straight and live a normal life. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean like I said that's I I I was always like that unpredictable and you know, hothead, but like I said, you know, I I I can't I can't promise anyone anything. I'll try, you know what I'm saying, but I just don't tolerate bullshit. You know, as of right now, I'm doing good like but I'm not letting nobody abuse me ever in my life. Like, it's just not happening. I try to do the right thing, you know, I, you know, but like I said, nobody's going to abuse me. And that's the problem. Somebody was trying to abuse me and I wasn't allowing it. And I end up, you know, getting in trouble for it. So that's the truth. But, you know, hothead, yeah, I don't know if I could change that. I'm trying. I work on it, but it's not easy, man. No, it's not easy. You're right. And here's another comment. The third one, this gene is something else. Doing dumb shit and constantly getting locked up it sucks. He's a petty crime guy. Go in for some good shit. Guy wants you to go into jail for some good shit. <laughs> guy wants you to rob a bank yeah. and split it. With him. That doesn't even make sense. So I'm happy I'm going to jail for petty shit because if I went to jail for what I was known for, I'd be doing life. I'm done. That's what a book at me. I love these little skid bids if I get in trouble. Six months, 90 days. That's a dream. I got that in the fucking bathroom. I love that. <laughs> 90 days. I can do it in my head in the closet spinning. <laughs> last one because again by the way 90 percent, 95 percent were all positive comments i had to really look deep to find some negative ones so from these internet gangsters we call them right internet gangsters right. <laughs> so i'm not gonna lie i thought gene was an asset on the show like him or hate him he doesn't make no bones about who he is real funny guy and John's still in shape, but he's kind of past his prime to be wearing a shirt with his chest out like that. LOL. I guess he took <laughs> shots at John too. <laughs> he got the best jackets. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, John dresses well. Mm-hmm. Sure. I want to I wanna throw some names at you and maybe you can just give us like whatever comes to mind about those people. And Dad. it's going to be totally up to you what you want to say, obviously. Um, but let's start. So... We'll start with your friend, John A. Light. Yeah, John A. Light. That's, well, that's more, that's like a good friend. Uh, me and him have so much shit going on together, but uh, 
me and him are about to be maybe be in a movie together. We're going to be filming shows again together. Me and him are super tight. I love John always, and I never turn on him. You know, he he fights with a lot of people, but never me. He always tells me, "Because Gene, you're the only one that doesn't turn on me." I said, "I know." <laughs> That's me, Johnny. Nice. And uh, you mentioned Anthony uh, Hootie Russo, so we actually sat down with him as well uh, a few weeks ago. So, what do you have to say yeah. about him? Hootie's my homeboy, man. That's that's like my brother, bro. I mean, I know Hootie since I'm a kid. I started off selling drugs for him when I was 16 years old. So, um, you know, that's that's my buddy, man. Hootie used to be the guy when I was younger. You know what I mean? So, um, I love Hootie, man. I still talk to him to this day. And your cousin, Anthony Ruggiano Jr.? Yeah, that's my man. Joe Camel, I call him. That's my fucking buddy right there. <laughs> Anthony, That's uh, I love Ant, man. I looked up to him growing up and... um. You know, like I said, he had a raw deal. He did 10 years for the life. I said 20 years total, but he did 10 years for the life, came home. They hit him with a cold case murder. He asked him to, you know, get him a lawyer. We did a charity for him. We gave more money than his own crew. And he said, fuck that. You know, he threw in the towel. I feel bad for Anthony. Anthony was a, is a good guy. But that's my cousin, and um, I'll be sitting with him soon, too. What about Donald Trump? Love him. Kidding me? Donald Trump, it's the GOAT right there. Best president of all time, man. Come on. Only guy that ever really, only president that really cares about the country. Can you imagine that? Everybody hates him. I mean, not everybody hates him. These assholes want him out. He's the best. I love him. Awesome. Well, if you ask about Donald Trump, we got to ask about Joe Biden. Oh, God. Fucking worst human on the planet. <laughs> oh, my God. Fucking brain dead fucking retard. Get him the fuck out of here. Holy <laughs> shit. What about uh, Andrew Tate? Bro, they all say I look like this guy. I got to hear this every fucking day. Everywhere I go, someone's going, Andrew hey, Tate, everyone fucks with me. They say I look like him. I know everyone thinks that. Bro, I got stopped. I was with my girl, my ex, um, Amelia. We were in some place in like an hour away from me, and the guy's taking a picture of me, joking around, goes, yo, you look like Andrew Tate. I'm like, all right, all right I keep hearing this shit, bro. Whatever. I wish I had his money. <laughs> I feel like you, and, and you, know, you know why maybe people might say that? I feel like you carry yourself like a real man like him. You know what I'm saying? Like, you stick up for right. yourself. You know, you say what you want to say, what's on your mind. And I think people kind of resonate, you know, and kind of put you guys together. But 100%, man. Yeah, I, I, I say what I want, bro. I don't tell people what they want to hear. I tell them the truth. I don't care. I ain't got nothing to protect. I'm not here trying to be a politician, a fucking mayor. I'm just an uh, ex-street gangster, and I tell how it is. Straight up, no bullshit, man. That's how we like it. What about Sammy yeah. the Bull? What about Sammy the Bull? Sammy the Bull is a serious guy, man. I, you know, I, I spoke with him a few times. I talked to his son here and there. Sammy was the underboss of the Gambino family. So at the end of the day, when he speaks, everybody's going to be glued to it because he was part of history. The guy's been a part of the most iconic things in mafia, you could say. They killed Paul Castellano. They took over the family. It's just, he's Sammy Gavano, bro. There's nothing you can do about that. That's it. He's Sammy Gavano. And last but not least, what about Michael Francis? Michael Francis, when I first came in the game, my thing with Mike Francis is that I didn't like that he wasn't admitting that he was a cooperator, so I was coming at him. He's actually a good guy, cool guy. Um, eventually, I'm, I'm going to try to do something with him, but uh, my whole thing was, you know, just admit what you did, you know what I'm saying? And that was my beef with him, and that's why I was coming at him. But Mike is a cool guy, and he knows the life very well, made millions of dollars. He wasn't a violent guy. He never said he was. I was just breaking his chops, but he's a cool guy, and I'm glad that he's open now about, you know, he did sit with the government and speak to them, and... That's it, you know. Let it be. Who cares? You know, it doesn't it doesn't change his 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 reputation or anything like that, you know? He's a cool guy. Awesome. And before we end our show, we usually do like a, a would you rather segment. So we give you a couple options and then you choose. Would you rather do this or that? So or we okay. call it this or that sometimes as well. So uh you wanna ask the first question? Go for it. Okay. Yeah. So if you had an opportunity and you got a chance to sit down with either Adolf Hitler or Jesus Christ, which one would you choose? Jesus Christ. How, yeah. co how come? Why, why would you want to sit down with him? Well, I want, I, I want, I want to know everything about the world. I want to know how, how we got here. I want to know the truth, man. <laughs> I like okay, that. Awesome. And uh, Gene, would you rather, you know, get a blank slate completely free of your, you know, past life? And, you know, live, live the way you'd live, you know, without that experience. Uh, or would you live with that experience and be able to, you know, help kids these days or give back somehow, some way by sharing your experiences and doing what you're doing now pretty much? What would you pick if you could, you know, do either or? 
If I had to do it over, I wouldn't change shit. <laughs> <All right. laughs> okay, right gun. No, I'm joking. I, I would definitely keep it like this. I would I would not uh, get a clean slate. I don't I don't have no regrets. The only regret I have is um the only re- only regret I really have is hurt the people that I so many people I hurt. That's it. Other than that, you know what? I like the life that I live, and I'm past it now. You know, I like talking to people. I like that people contact me and always want to get advice from me. I love that stuff, so I don't mind it. I'll stay right here. And, and last question from this segment is if you had an opportunity to go back in time and change one thing about your past or you have a chance to look into your future right now which one would you pick look into my future i want to know i want to know if i'm going to be a millionaire bro i've been waiting you're there you're there <laughs> now you're a millionaire now I want to know if I'm going to be an actor or a millionaire or I'm going to do it. What's going to happen? Because I know it's coming. I just want to know when. <laughs> are you work? Are you working on some uh, some projects now? Uh, another but What are you working yeah, on? Yeah, I, I have a ton of stuff just coming out. Like everything, I got delayed so much with the jail stuff and going in and out of jail. Now everything's about to just come. My TV show, possibly being in a movie, uh, podcast. Just a lot of things are going good for me right now. So I'm only 39 years old. I still got a lot to go. So everything's about to unfold very shortly. Well, you have the charisma, definitely. That's for sure. I think a lot of people yeah. uh, really like your straight up attitude. Uh, like I said, we, right. we read the comments. Like a lot of people love you, and honestly, you don't see that too much these days. You know, you see a lot of haters in the right. comments. But I can actually say, like for your videos, and I was watching them on TikTok and on YouTube. Like a lot of people love you, so I definitely think that um, you know you, you're you're up there, and people want to see more of you. So. Uh, I'm excited. I'm excited to see more content and uh, definitely got to set something up uh, in person very soon with you. Absolutely. Yes. A hundred percent. I can't wait to sit with you guys. Definitely. Yeah. And any last words for our audience, but before we let you go. Yes. Uh, make sure to go check out my book, Born in the Life. My Instagram is Gene Borello. If you want an autograph copy from me personally, DM me. I answer everybody. I'm not a snooty fake celebrity. I answer everyone. Um, I'm not a celebrity in my brain. Um, so you can uh, contact me and DM me. Um, if you have, don't want that, go on Amazon, purchase it. I have a bestseller, sold over 10,000 copies, I'm trying to make it into a TV show. And that's it. I just um, thank you for having me on the show, man. So, Gene, thank you. You did this pretty quickly. I know, uh, you know, a call was made and a favor was called for. And we appreciate you wanting to, to come on our show. And, yeah, we do look forward to sitting down with you very soon. Yes, definitely, man. Gene Borello, thank you so much again for your time, brother. This was awesome. Can't wait to do this again in person, though. Maybe get a workout in or something like that when we come to come out there. Who knows, man? Let's yeah, do definitely. it. Definitely. Definitely. I'll train you, bro. I'm in train mode right now. I'm training everybody. Let's go. Let's do it, Let's man. go. Thank man. you. <laughs> and until next time, you guys, thanks for watching and tuning in. Hit that subscribe button. We'll see you soon.